that's like the that's like like the very like the very first point he tries to explain through his theory of environment and the, and what he calls the ecumen he tries to explain how is it possible that we belong to nature on the one hand and on the other hand we belong to this other realm that we call spirit intelligence or uh, less esotericality culture so what he's going to do is to show us this uh, link between one of the other, but more importantly, the dynamic link, which he calls trajection. So it's it's a relationship between something called nature and who will, uh, and that will play the role of the subject in the very Aristotelian terms. And we have on the other hand, culture, which will play the role of predicate. But what what what's precisely his aim? Well, Number one, I would say, is to oppose both what we call physicalism, that, that means in, in a very particular sense, to reduce mind to mechanical, mechanical interactions. But at the same time, what we have called, uh, I, I don't know if the term is the best, but subjectivism, or uh, I, I, I think uh, Meliasu called this uh, correlationism, just to, just to characterize the idea that uh, and uh, that the world is just our representation that more or less in a Kantian or I would say in a Fichtian fashion. So another, another interesting thing about his position is the tra transdisciplinary uh, approach. That is, he's, uh, he studied geography, but at the same time, there are elements of geography, philosophy, biology linguistics and logic and that's that's very that's very interesting because we were, we were talking about a moment a moment ago uh just a minute about uh, the necessity of articulating different levels and that's that's the real uh, that's the real problem because we uh, as we approach the different areas of inquiry we would we, we not share the same presupposition so when we and, and that was and that was a very very interesting question. Is it the same the cosmos or the universe as, as, as the organism? What's what the existence of an idea or why can we speak about the existence of an idea or a theory, the existence of a community of individuals like the species or the existence of individuals or the existence of processes in nature? We, we, don't, we don't have the same language, and we don't have the same presuppositions to speak about it. So I will I will come to that point. But I think that uh, philosophy of nature needs to be diagonal to and and information. Just to say something about my my preceding speaker, uh, information seems to be a, a very diagonal approach and very interesting. And uh, and I think that Berk is aware of that, and that's why he he relies some so much on predication and some mathematical ideas uh, coming from Peirce also, but I, 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 will, I will say a little bit more uh, in, in a minute. On the other hand, he tries to be concrete because we have, you know, philosophers and I consider myself a philosopher, we are always accused of being too abstract and, and then, you know, advancing very general ideas of the universe without really giving account of individual individual things. So he tries to be concrete and and to, and to and to do this, and that that's what I find very, very interesting of his approach is this east-west dialogue. For example, in the in, in logic, he confronts the classical so-called Aristotelian logic with non-classical logic, but instead of discussing contemporary, contemporary uh, logicians, he resorts to, for example, Buddhist or uh, Indian logic, which develop what we would call today uh, uh, non-classical logic, like for example, uh, the tetralim, in which you have you know, affirmation, negation, contradiction, and uh, third given, tertium, tertium that. Um, <clears throat> so that's that that becomes very very interesting because he really tries to uh, not only advance a concept of trajection, which could be translated as translation, but he also puts that into work. Translate the east into the west, 
geography into philosophy, nature into culture. And that's precisely the question. We, it's not so much that we, we are discussing right now what is you know, nature in very physical terms, or what is culture, but the enigma coming over and over and over again is how do we pass from one to the other? And uh, going still further, is it really that we can talk of nature as a unity opposed or complementary to culture? Or as, as it, was going, it was being said, there are certain traits that we consider historically just exclusive from culture that we find uh, actually in nature and the other way around. We see also the persistence of so-called nature in what we call uh, our culture. So this, with all this, he tries to ground a general theory of milieu, environment, or space, but based on three concepts. Basically to Cora, which was also mentioned, it appears in the Timaeus of Plato, and Basho, it's a, it's a Chinese, sorry, a Japanese, a Japanese concept uh, coined by Nishida. Well, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Nishida, I think, I think. Um, which is both uh, philosophical and metaphysical uh, on the one hand, and on the other, it tries to be concrete enough to be uh, operative for sciences, right? And uh, what I will concentrate on is this last part, which is a logic of place. This is, so to speak, the formal approach uh, of Berck to the whole problem, this, this is like the structure uh, and the argumentative uh, uh, scheme, to, to say it like that, in which the relationship nature and culture will be explained. So for this, he will rely on three elements. First, a theory of predication, SSP, classical, uh, apophantic uh, uh, predication as it appears in Aristotle. Second, a um, more or less mathematical idea of iteration, the possibility of, you know, if you have a relationship of subject and predicate, and then you predicate on that, you can make that composite again a new a new subject of predication, and you can iterate this uh, this relationship up to infinity. And uh, the the third element, which I I, I don't know if it's really um, sufficiently explored by him, but he tries to show that uh, this relationship, nature, culture should be addressed not in, in classical terms. Um, that means following the principle of not contradiction, but uh, resorting to non-classical logics. Now, what I will try to show uh, is that number one, uh, the logic of place, which he tries to define, could be better modeled or thought through in terms of category theory, number one. And number two, the main problem I see is that predication and non-classical logic do not, uh, uh, do not tolerate each other. They do not get along. So first of all, trajection. Uh, tries to characterize the indissociable relationship, nature and culture. That, that is to say, we cannot uh, consider one with, with, without the other. Uh, that, that, there is agreement on that, but the point is, what's the new? What's the new thing? So he, he speaks of Plato's Cora, and this, is, this becomes very, very interesting because if you, if you have read or has uh, landed in your hands the Timaeus of Plato, there is some marvelous discussion of, the, of, of space. And he doesn't use the term uh, topos, as it will be the case in Aristotle, but he speaks about Cora. And Cora, he says, is like, yes, it's like, it's where things dwell, so to speak. It's not where things are, because that's the place. You know, uh, in terms of uh, Cartesian, of the Cartesian plane, that would be the place uh, in, in terms of topos. The characterization in terms of coordinates, objective coordinates, uh, 
into axis or n axis axis uh, and the objective determination would be the topos but the quora would be at the same time the place in which things are but not objectively but also in concrete terms so in this sense the quora a space is the receptacle of things and the and, and plato gives uh, some 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 metaphors of space being like a mother nourishing uh, nourishing all things but at the same time he says space has a form so here comes the problem because forms are in space or forms dwell in space but if that's the case space cannot have a form but if it would be the case then we would be in a circle but that's the point and 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 and, and this this might be very uh, esoterical when you read it in, in plato but if you take a look at geometry uh, as it was developed in the 19th century especially uh from gauss and uh, riemann on you can perfectly see that this is the case you the forms and the properties for example of a triangle depend on the space in which you inscribe it for example if there's a zero curvature or if test there's a positive or negative then the properties that's the the internal sum of the angles will will give you different outcomes depending on which space you are inscribing your, uh, your uh, the figures of geometry oh, like the circle the triangle uh the square etc whatever but at the same time you have to accept that these are different shapes of space so space gives uh, <laughs> uh makes room for forms but at the same time space can have different forms and not only that space can vary its forms from point to point and so these are the, we know this from uh from gauss and riemann and especially later as it was uh was used in einstein's theory of relativity of general relativity but that's that that's one of the that's one of the things uh Berg tries to think with the concept of uh milieu environment and i will say in a moment what what is what is trajection but uh the, the the second idea is not only to how how to relate uh, or how to think to, to how to think at the same time space as being form uh as giving space for us giving uh yeah aware aware to be of things but also being formed but at the same time it has to relate two two elements we say the subject and the predicate or nature and culture so this means that the things are not in themselves but there has to be some coming out and, the, and he resorts to this uh this discussion of heidegger uh what does it mean to be for someone that means there is some ek that it has to come out of itself there is there are not things in themselves they have to manifest to other things and things in general should not be considered in a substantial way but relationally how they express to each other or to express might give some idealistic uh, idealistic picture but coming out of itself could be also to interact with other with other objects so uh, I wanted uh, so so I I, I, I in in red in, in, in red fonts I'm, I'm showing the idea is the, the, the ideas I'm pointing and I'm aiming at first of all geometry and the plurality of geometries we can come up with in mathematics then these different approaches in, uh, in set theory in which you don't have structure but you just, you just have elements and the um, uh, and, 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 and the operation of belonging to and as opposed or not opposed complementary to category theory which is the approach I, want, I, I am presenting now and the other idea and that this is this is like uh, I will tell you the joke <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that trajection is a morphism that is coming out of itself and manifesting or manifesting to other or interacting to others 
can be grasped, uh, formalized, and understood as a morphism. And I will say more about that, but morphisms are just to have a, a general idea, maybe an intuitive idea, is a generalization of the concept of function. That means that you have one object related to other, or to put it in set, in set theory, you have one set and you have one rule to relate it to another set such that you put in relation some elements of the domain with elements of the codomain. And you can also see this as input and output. You can see it as one object and another object or one topological space and another topological space. Uh, and you can see it both in a, in a dynamic way, like a transformation, or you can see it as a relationship between two, like a map, like a static map of one, uh, one picture, so to speak, to use a metaphor, one picture of uh, another thing, like a map regarding a territory. So I will, um, I will give you a quote to have a flavor of what uh, uh, Berg is thinking with this concept of ecumen which would be the general environment and the environment would be this relationship, this complex relationship between S, P and, uh, and, uh, and a bar and um, how this should explain or give us, uh, you know, a tool to explore the relationship between uh, nature and culture, but in a uh, mm, dynamic, dynamic way. So I, I, will, I will give you, I will give you this, this quote, which is found, which is found in his book, uh, Likumen. Human existence is geographic. Not only do we have necessarily a physical place, a lieu, this would be the topos of Aristotle on the planet, but our being is grounded, siphoned, on the structural coupling of an animal body and a technical and symbolical environment, a milieu. Its complement is thus social and ecological at the same time. At the same time. Such a coupling, which is trajection, that's trajection, it's the coupling of this uh, relata. Such a coupling creates engendre the reality of human environments whose set ensemble forms the ecumen the ontogeographical relationship of humanity and Earth. Now, uh, the questions that arise at this moment is, with this approach of Burke, not his general idea, because that, that's what I want to distinguish. You have, on the one hand, this idea of having to ground humanity in nature we have he, he wants to show the transits between nature and culture but another point is how to articulate or how to solve that problem through a theory of predication right so there are some issues or i, I would not call them problems because most of them are not necessarily of or wouldn't be of interest maybe uh, in, in the theory of Beck, but I think they are, if we want to think about the philosophy of nature, they're very important elements. And, uh, and they were, uh, and, and we spoke about it just a, a, a moment ago. First of all, is the question of individuality. Um, he, he will say that uh, you have a subject and a predicate, and that is for someone, that's valid for someone. You have like, for example, the subject, the subjectum, and you express the subject by a predicate, but you place that predication or that predication is valid for someone. So to, to say it, for example, in terms of Uxkul, you have a relationship of the, uh, you have connections in the world, but that has to be relevant for a living being so that such a connection is made. So being significant or for a connection to be significant, you need to put it in person terms, the interpretant. And that's what he tries to, he, he, he tries to incorporate to his formula, but, 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 <laughs> there, is, there is not 
a definition of what is an individual, how do individuals uh, emerge, and also how individuals are also a matter of, uh, of scale, right? Because it, it's not the same uh, in a discourse if you're speaking about individuals, for example, in psychology, uh, or if you're speaking about society in, the, in, in, social, in sociology. It's, it's really not a problem, and I, I don't see a real discussion between the individual and society. It's a matter, it's a matter of the level of aggregation or complexity you are dealing with. But that, that, that seems to be seems to me to be a, a at least at least an issue to be dealt with individuality because this this has this has to do also with first and the problem of the continuum and the discreteness of the world. And I don't think you can uh, handle or treat uh, the relationship between nature and culture without addressing the problem of individuals, the consistency of individuals, the traits and interactions between individuals, and uh, the continuity or the problem of the, of the continuum. So these are, these are related, the individuality, uh, scale issues, and the symmetry, because if you, it, it, when you have when you have mathematical equality, for example, and you say that three plus three equals six, you can invert you can invert the relationship and say six equals three plus three, and there's not there there's not a problem with that. But with predication, it's you cannot do that. You can say because you have a subject and you have a predicate which are of different nature. So you can say the house is blue, but you cannot say the blue is house. Right? That's not how the copula of the is works. It's one direction, it's one sided, so to speak. So if you want to if, 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 if you want to develop an idea of the interactions between nature and culture, or within nature or within culture, you need several arrows. And if you have just one type of arrow, which is one directed from the subject to the predicate then you lose a lot of flexibility and a lot of possibilities. And first uh, and, and, among, and above all, the, positive, the possibility of grasping complex, complex, complex interactions, symmetries or different types of symmetries, because I'm, I'm not talking about um, strict symmetry in which you, you, could, you could change the terms. I'm, uh, I'm speaking more that different types of arrows that can go in different in different directions. I will not go into more details. There are a lot of things to be said, but uh, I will. Ju I'm just pointing out some of the issues I find interesting and complicated uh, in the in the theory of of uh, uh, the, the, the 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 other point is like he tends to underscore and put more emphasis in the human world. Well, yes, of course, <laughs> we all do that, but it, 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 it seems to me that you cannot do justice to a philosophy of nature if, we, if you are all the time showing just how the worlds appear to you as a subject without seeing how the world interacts with the world, like a particle with another particle or a, mechanical interactions or quantic or of another sort. It seems to me that there is an overpresence of Uxkul or that Uxkul gives a general idea, uh, shapes interpretation of, uh, of trajection in Berg such that we are always seeing from the point of view of humanity. The whole, the, the whole point seems to not only relate nature and culture, but to show how that constitutes uh, the ecumen, which is basically human. Hmm? Now, another problem is that there does not seem to be intermediate levels between so-called raw nature and human beings. It's taken as a global relationship, like the whole of nature and the whole of culture. And then you have this, uh, this relationship, but I don't think I don't, I think it's very artificial. I know it has been done like that in, in Western civilization, but at the same time, you have to break it and, and show, for example, the, the animal has been a problem, you know, a philosophical problem, 
because it seems it doesn't belong entirely to human culture, like subjectivity, sorry, and it's not a thing. So this, this, is, this is relatively clear, but there are also intermediary levels within so-called uh, non-living or uh, inorganic matter. And we cannot, we cannot treat matter in general as we cannot treat being in general without making the distinctions levels of organization, levels of complexity, etc. One, one of the things, however, that I like very much from, uh, from, from Burke's perspective is the idea that a same thing, a, the same thing can appear in different manners for different actors without or being the same thing at the same time. Okay, I will say it again. You can have a thing a, and this thing A can appear in different manners for different observers without ceasing to be the same object A. So this gives rise to the plurality of interpretations without, uh, without falling into the trap of uh, incommensurability, incommensurability of, of points of view. But the problem, and I will come to that later, is the gluing the gluing of perspective, the glue of perspective, the gluing of subjects, the gluing of things to really constitute what he's aiming at, namely the ecumen as this general idea of the universe relating different, different elements in different levels and in different, in different direction. So here comes the question. Can we interpret trajection in mathematical fashion, uh, sorry, fashion as morphism? This is a this is a diagram I uh, I did based on Salamia's interpretation of of purse, um, which shows um, theory. This is topos. This is more shifts, uh, shifts and topos theory, especially shifts, has developed. Uh, especially used by Grothendieck, and, uh, but I, I will not come to that. It's just, I, I would like to, I will try to give some elements to point as, at this direction, but I don't know if I will make it. So I said this, trajection is inspired by Plato's Quora, some ideas of Heidegger and some ideas of uh, Japanese, especially the school of Kyoto like uh, Nishida, but he, he also results in all of things like Nishitani, which I don't, I, I, I don't know, I, 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 don't, I don't claim any understanding of or knowledge about them. Uh, and the biosemantics of uh, Uke school and some, some others. But formally, so with, which is the part I was concentrating on, I am concentrating on, which is the, the skeleton or, or the argumentative skeleton is based in a lot, Let's to formulate a logic of place uh, based on a theory of predication. Now, what I want to show is that predication is a very limited way to articulate what he's aiming at, and that morphisms would do much, much more than the concept of trajection, or, or that trajection should be and is already uh, it's already operating in. Uh, August on Berg's work as a morphism. So um, let me, oops, no. So what is a morphism? I have to say, that the, 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 so I, I said that the first problem of this presentation was that not everybody's acquainted with uh, Berg's, uh, Berg's work. So I, I gave you like, just the flavor. On the other hand, not everybody's acquainted with uh, category theory. And uh, I said I'm not a, ma a mathematician, but I will give you also a general idea why I like it and in conceptual terms, what is it all about? So uh, morphism is a concept which plays a central role in category theory. Actually, I'm talking about morphisms, but the more general structures in which morphisms uh, have a meaning is category theory. So what is category theory? Well, it's a general abstract mathematical theory 
about structures, of course, mathematical structures. Now, a category is composed of just two elements, objects, which are like the points in a space. But this might be misleading because I'm not thinking about uh, geometric points, just, just, just the singular elements or the individuals that play a role in this structure. You can point at them. You can call them A and B and C and D and so on. So that's the first part. So those are the objects of the category. And the other element is how these objects are related to each other. So it's pretty simple and pretty intuitive. You have elements and you have relationships. And these relationships are called morphisms. Now, being a general theory of mathematical structures, and by the way, alternative to set, uh, to set theory, I would say complementary. I, I, I wouldn't go that far as to say that it represents, uh, and you know, it's an alternative for the foundation of mathematics uh, compared to set theory, but uh, they solve different types of problems. And even though category theory can be used for the so-called working mathematician, um, they have different, you know, they, they have different manners of understanding what is it to ground mathematics. What, what, what's the general concept of mathematics? I will say it's very fast. Uh, set theory goes, you know, like a microscope to the constituent elements. And the last elements, which are sets, if you we, we take this uh, axiomatization of Sir Mel Frankel, sets uh, are the basic elements, but uh, sets are composed of points they are always composed of points. So you really come to the ground and you cannot go any further. Points are the last constituents and then you can construct. And that's how more or less uh, set theory grounds the rest of mathematics. You have the basic elements with the axioms and then you can construct uh, other types of mathematical, mathematical objects. So you don't have structure from the beginning, you just have membership. The, the this operator for membership and the elements and you define membership by uh, by defining properties and if some elements uh, comply with this uh, with this uh, uh, with these properties or not on the other hand category theory does not have ultimate elements it starts from from top to down so the basic the basic element it's not the object it's the whole structure the whole structure is the object or the objects considering all the relationships of that thing with itself, that object with itself, and with other objects, let's say, surrounding it. And all this, uh, all this structure of elements or, sorry, objects and relationships, it's what constitutes an, uh, a category. And objects are not defined, some, as I was saying, as ultimative elements, they are just something in so far they are related to another object. In other terms, it's just precisely what uh, Beak is saying about trajection. An object is what it does to other objects or this, the set of relationships it has with other objects. So how does this look like? Because I have been speaking of uh, the theory of predication, et cetera, in, in Austenberg, and I, have, I haven't given any, any, any picture. So this is, how, this, is how it, this is how it looks. You have an, um, I, I, I took this from Rodrigo. I think he's, I think he's there. I, I, I like very much his, uh, um, I, I know he, he uh, I, I found it in a paper he, he published. Well, it, 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 there were some ideas he published in the, in the blog of Austenberg, and I, I like his uh, explanation very much. So he, he put it here, like R of I means some reality. That means you have, you, you have the sub-index I. So there are several realities, and that, that's also a problem, but we'll come to that, I, I hope so. But some reality, means a relationship of subject and predicate. That means there is a subject of predication, a substance as in Aristotle, and this substance expresses or is expressed 
in human terms as predication. So, but this is not just in general, that is valid for some I, and I is some individual. So to say it again, some reality for some interpretant means a relationship of subject and predicate, which means S as P, en tant que, is en tant que peu. So that's the basic relationship. Things appear as something in general. For example, a lamp appears as, or this object appears as a lamp, or a lamp appears as an object to illuminate, or it appears as a, as a weapon, you know, to defend yourself from someone who's attacking you, or uh, it appears as an object of luxury, whatever. That, that means that things appear in a certain fashion, from a certain perspective, in a certain context, from a certain point of view. But that point of view is, of course, related to an interpretant. Now, the problem is, and it's going to be, how many realities there are and how many interpretants you can have, how you relate different interpretants and how you can construct these trajective chains, which is basically the iteration of, uh, of these predicative uh, uh, these predicative relationships. So this is how, this is, uh, this is the general formula, so to speak, of, of projection. And uh, on the other hand, on the right hand, you can see uh, two forms, two diagrams, two equivalent diagrams of very simple category. You have X, Y, and Z, and you have the arrows connecting and between X, X and Y, you have a function, the, 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 the morphism F, you have uh, between Y and Z, the morphism G, and then you have the composition of G given F, which relates Z, uh, X, to, X to Z. So this, this, is, this is the first diagram, or you can put it horizontally, right? So basically what you're saying is that all elements are related and some are related directly and some are mediated by the others and you can establish a relationship with the first and the last element because there is something called composition. And what is composition? Just to give you an example, is what we say, is like take partial orders, which uh, have to deal with how to order a set according to one criteria, like with the operator being bigger than. So if one, if one element is bigger than, A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, then A is bigger than C, right? That's uh, uh, the, this is one, one of examples, just one of example, it really is more, more general, but this is one of examples of, of composition. Um, so I already explained this, uh, uh, the terms, you know, there are some, some very abstract things that, I'm not going to go into. So there are some axioms that have to be fulfilled in, uh, in category theory, but compared to the complexity of the axioms of set theory, that's nothing that is really simple. It's really intuitive and uh, it's really flexible and it has given in, 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 in mathematics really amazing results, especially in uh, algebraic topology. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Let me uh, let me go. Let me go to this. This is what I find the most interesting, but at the same time problematic in Berg's theory. And this is why uh, sometimes it works predication, and sometimes it just doesn't. And it has and it has to do with these equivalences, or he also calls them homologies, which I find uh, to be establish rather uh, fast and, and, and this, is, this is the core. He says, the basic relationship of my thought is trajection, which relates a subject to a predicate. And those are these letters S and P. But at the same time, subject is understood as nature, 
it also it is also understood as metaphysical substance is understood as being in the sense of Heidegger and his uh, ontological difference. And it's, uh, it's understood also as being, as, as the positive term. On the other hand, the predicate is understood as spirit and culture and as accident and as not being. And, that, and here is where everything starts to become uh, problematic because he has insisted so much on not relying on, 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 on the classical use of negation as opposing being to non-being, subject as pre or predicate as being not subject, non-subject. And, you know, in the very end, I think, the concept of trajection, which should explain how nature turns into or is translated into culture is tied because there are classical oppositions. There are very classical oppositions. And the most obvious is this one between being and not being, nature being the subject and the substance and humanity being this nothingness, this pure spirituality, uh, the pure predicate, and especially that non-being, but at the same time, he's saying that the, us humans are not pure not being, are not pure accident, we are also a body. And it's not clear if the body should fall on the side of P or on the side of S. And uh, he gives a very, very interesting example to show how trajection means translating. So if you have, for example, race, and I will finish in a minute, if you have uh, the rays of light, then you have like one realm, and when that touches your retina, uh, that it, that energy is translated into information coded by cones. And I, I, I don't remember my uh, anatomy. And then you have to translate that that information in the retina to in the electrical impulses, and then you have to translate this into uh, you know chemistry neurotransmitters. And that is also then uh, uh, translated into an image, for example, what the image of what you're saying. So in all these levels, you have a, you have a translation, you have a, an element of, of trajection, but in this moment, it does not, it will not do a simple separation of subject and predicate to say that rays are the subject and uh, the retina is a predicate or that that, uh, that complex is another subject to the predicate called, for example, electrical impulses, just, just doesn't, doesn't work anymore. So, and this is where I, I, will, I will end. Uh, we can translate our, you know, re, uh, relation, uh, reality as a category. That means a context. Some reality is not for some person. It might be for a group of persons or a species or whatever. It can be as abstract and flexible or concrete as you want. So realities are categories. So they are special spaces with properties in which some elements called objects dwell. So instead of saying that there are subjects and predicates of different ontological nature, we could just speak of uh, abstract objects as we do in sets. For example, when you are relating to sets, it really doesn't matter what they are all about. One could be nature and the other spirit, or both could be nature, or both could be spirit. The important, the really important thing is the trajectory relationship. And he's using here uh, this, this sign here. And that's the arrow. Those are the arrows connecting the different subspaces of, you know, the of, of the universe, and they constitute different different categories in which you have different rules and which define the possible interaction, the possible and the actual interactions of the of the objects, and that should eventually lead us to the possibility of more complex relationships. Uh, in which we could combine, and that's, that's, that's what I said, I was not going to arrive to this, but eventually 
we could try to show how all these different categories relate to each other, because that's how we compose peu à peu this gluing of the universe to progressively gain more complex details and interesting idea of our existence in the in the universe. So thank you, thank you very much for your incredible patience. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hola, Rodrigo. Hola. <laughs> okay, so that's that, that that that's it. I don't know if you have uh, maybe a question or a concern. Oh, hi, hi, hi there. Sorry. Yes. Am I allowed to speak now? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So uh, thank you for the um, your presentation. It was, I think it was very interesting. And um, I guess like you, you mentioned that there was two challenges, like one knowing uh, about uh, Berkey's theory and the other category theory. Uh, I had like half of the homework done. I knew from uh, Berkey's background, but I didn't know much about category theory. So it was it was very interesting how you tried to make the link between these two. And um, there was, uh, I think one of the main points of your talk was to um, make the claim that uh, the classic predication system is, is quite problematic for trying to model, model Berkey's thought. And I would say that I, I agree with this um, in a very general sense. and. Um, I've also been in touch with uh, someone that is doing a PhD uh, uh, concerning Berkey's theory, and and we sometimes talk about uh, these mathematical uh, avenues of, uh, and we don't really like it because, as you say, uh, I think the main the main problem with it it's it's uh, unidirectionality, like just goes in one sense and. I think it's it's also due because uh, if you see the the glossaire de mythology, like the uh, dictionary of mythology. Um, when Berkey defines trajection, he gives two alternate uh, definitions. One, as you say, is is very um, circular, or or it goes in, it can go in many directions because he says that um, trajection is the coming and going of reality between the theoretical poles of subject and object. So it can go from object to subject and from subject to object, object and also incorporating the, the I don't know, the, the dynamics between technology and ecology and uh, sim, uh, symbols of society, language, etc. And there's the other, uh, the second um, definition of trajection, which is the more classical or Aristotelian, which is the assumption of S en tant que P. So, um, I think that uh, since he, he he proposes these two um, definitions, it makes it, it makes it uh, it produces a certain kind of inconsistency um, for for someone who wants to um, get a more integrated sense of of how this part this mathematical part uh, is in a sense uh, a core that represents his, his uh, entire philosophy. So just to make that point that I, I agree that um, this uh, classical logic, um, Aristotelian logic uh, is very poor, is very poor uh, uh, in order to model uh, the, all the different kinds of interactions uh, that Berkey's thought invites to us, invite, invites us to to think about and 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 how you and how you say it, like to glue all these uh, different kinds of uh, perspectives. Um, yes, and and also from from the, um, I I would I, I would say that your presentation on category theory was very succinct. So I would have appreciated more uh, 
dedication on 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 how to apply this uh, category theory into Berkey's thought. Maybe it was too uh, short in time. I would have appreciated more explanation on it. But that's about it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I I will give two references. Category theory is really incredibly abstract and complicated, but there are especially two philosophers that uh, have inspired me and have really dedicated a lot of time to translate, you, you know, to offer an interpretation, a philosophical interpretation, or to show the philosophical interpretations of category theory. And one of them, and above all, is uh, Fernando, Fernando Salamea. He's, uh, I, 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 I can give you later some, some references and give you some, some articles and things I have from him. But uh, he, uh, he, he, his, his main idea is uh, departing from, from curse is first how to think at not only a triadic relationship, <laughs> firstness, secondness, and thirdness, but how to work at the same time with different sheets and layers of interpretation and how to interlace them. And the basic problem of, uh, of, 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 uh, of topology and then and some, some, in, some part in, in Riemann and then uh, in, in, in Grothendieck is that you have functions and functions are very beautiful because they are continuous, they are differentiable. And this, the, the idea of, uh, of is continuity. Right, we try to restitute continuity, but the problem is we cannot do it on the same on the same plane. So how to create complex spaces in which you can glue different perspectives of the world? That's that's the basic that's the basic idea. So how how how, how do you fix this space in which you want your function to live in order to show the continuities? Because some functions just don't just break in one part. If you if you're using the complex plane, for example, just one complex plane, you try to show how uh, you by differential equations how something deploys in time, and you can have very beautiful forms and topological forms, and you can have curves and whatever. But sometimes at a certain point, it doesn't go any further, and you you want to you want to see how things connect, and you want to see the development of big uh, phenomena and the problem and, and when, when what, uh, for example, Riemann comes up with is, why don't you take one piece of the function in one copy of the complex plane and then you take another complex plane and then you see if there is an intersection and you glue them together. And it's like gluing the different perspectives you have of the world and to do that, you have to come up with a very interesting and rich space. And this is more or less what uh, shift, shift theory is, is, is about. You have like the world, which you, you could say is like some world of experience. And then you add structure, additional structure to, that, to, to different parts of that world. So you can enrich it and you can construct a very complex and beautiful world in which you can show different interactions of different parts of which you thought were separated or that you suspected some connection but you didn't have the space to show that things interact. So the whole point about sp space is to construct spaces that show you interactions you care about and this care about has a lot to do with first with, with pragmatic uh, uh, consequences. You, know, you know that some connections are very important for your relationship uh, to nature or technical relationships to health or to, uh, to the neighbor. So they are always pragmatic relationships, but the, the work of thought is to create those spaces in reality and in mind uh, uh, complex enough to show interactions between different parts of the world. So basically that's the idea of Salamea and um, and the other guy with who, who's following Salamea but makes more a Deleuzean interpretation of category theories, Rocco Gangel, uh, who, who wrote a book called uh, Diagrammatic Immanence. And they are very gentle introductions for 
false <laughs> philosophers to mathematical to mathematical mm -hmm. stuff and with philosophical relevance. But thank, thank you, thank you very much, and we will keep in touch. We we we, we talked about. Thank this. you, thank you very much, uh, thank you very much, Arturo. Uh,